Welcome back everyone to Retro Movie Review Theater. It's the Reluctant Gringo back again with another video. On August 18th, 1961, the Santa Cruz Sentinel's banner headline was Seabird Invasion Hits Coastal Homes. It detailed how, quote, millions of birds that were migrating along the coast began crashing into cars, into buildings, broke off television antennas from rooftops, smashed street lights, and tried to break through windows and doors to get into homes. When the residents of the town went outside in the middle of the night to see what was going on, the birds, perhaps attracted by their flashlights, attacked them too. If this sounds like a horror movie, well, legendary director Alfred Hitchcock thought so too. He had already bought the rights to Daphne du Maurier's 1952 novel, The Birds, and he needed something spectacular to follow up his signature film Psycho from a few years before. It seemed like the universe was screaming for this film to be made. 1963's The Birds was one of the most influential horror films ever made, one that John Carpenter and Guillermo del Toro has cited as inspirational to their works, and it was a nightmare to make and to work on. So spoiler alert for those who've not yet seen it, I'll try to be as vague as possible, and with that, let's get into it. The film itself has no closing credits. It has no film score. It utilized thousands of live birds captured in the wild to film certain scenes. It used a sodium vapor process for special effects instead of a blue screen, which meant getting Disney involved, the only studio in the world at the time with expert knowledge on how to do the technique. The film starred veteran actor Rod Taylor, future Oscar winner Jessica Tandy, Suzanne Plachette, and newcomer Tippi Hedren, who Hitchcock signed to a seven-year contract after seeing her in just a 15-second commercial for Diet Soda. The Birds may be Hitchcock's second most horrific film, just behind Psycho. The narrative centers around Melanie Daniels and her relationship with Mitch Brenner. They meet in a bird store in San Francisco. Mitch, a lawyer, knows Melanie from her trial where she was accused of destroying a storefront because of a practical joke gone wrong. Mitch plays his own joke on Melanie to make her see how it feels. However, Melanie is not a shy woman. She's wealthy, fond of being a prankster, of always having the last say and the last laugh. She's a compulsive liar, has an elitist ego, is known for jumping into fountains naked while vacationing in Europe, and was abandoned by her mother at age 11. She is someone who has always had an air of control about her, but internally, she's nothing but confusion and sadness. Mitch, who's a lawyer, can see right through her, but Melanie cannot let Mitch have the last laugh to show Mitch just how far she will go for a prank, and to get even. Melanie orders two lovebirds, uses her connection with the press to track down Mitch's license plate, gets in her own car, drives 60 miles northward up the California coast to Bodega Bay, finds information on Mitch's sister, who is having a birthday, and Mitch's home address by lying to the townsfolk about who she is and why she's there, finds the local school teacher, lies to her to get the correct name of Mitch's sister, which is Kathy, rents a motorboat to cross Bodega Bay in stealth, legally enters Mitch's home, leaves the two birds and a note, and then sneaks back out only to be seen by Mitch. Yes, this woman has impulsive tendencies amongst other traumas. The first 45 minutes of the film is character-driven, focused on the relationships between our various players. Mitch and sister Kathy taking care of their mother Lydia, played by Tandy, Annie, the school teacher and former lover of Mitch, who bonds with Melanie over her current predicament, and Melanie, who seems to have invaded the town, their lives, and brought chaos to their calm order. However, always in the background, there is something looming, something not right, something off, that keeps our characters continually wondering, what's wrong with those birds? The horror starts out slow. A single bird, a single strike, then a seagull breaking its own neck against Annie's door like a dark omen, and then the attacks begin, and the relationships, the pranks, the banter, all of that becomes meaningless in the face of the unknowable, the indefensible, and the unexplainable behavior of the birds as they look to cause as much harm as possible. The film is a classic horror film. In 1963, audiences were terrified, and the suspense and dread of the birds attacking on screen still hold up today as unnerving. But that's the film. What about the production? On a budget of $2.5 million, which would be about $25 million today, the film grossed $53 million worldwide, which would be over half a billion with today's inflation factored in. Thousands of birds were wrangled from the wild. However, the crows and the ravens were so smart that the handlers on set had a hard time training them, and they were also very independent. In the scene with the children's birthday party, the birds swooped down and popped balloons with their beaks, and to make sure this happened, seagulls were captured and their beaks taped shut with a pin sticking out. One flew away and the production shut down as they looked for it. The handlers were concerned that it would die because it could not drink or eat. Eventually, they did find it, and they did free the gull. The birds attacked the cast and crew constantly. They were wild. 
and they were smart. It was not uncommon for multiple cast and crew members to be sent to the hospital every day due to cuts, gouges, and scratches, and yes, birds do go for the eyes, so caution to protect your face was tantamount on set. Our fine feathered friends also carried lice, which infested a lot of the crew and cast, and treatment was constantly required to stave off a bigger infestation. Finally, to get the birds to stay still, such as in the closing scene where they're covering the house or the playground scene outside the school, the birds were fed a steady diet of wheat and whiskey. Yep, most of those birds on screen are drunk. Some of them kept falling over, and there were dedicated crew members there to stand them back up again. No one was immune from the birds. There's an anecdote that some of the crows got away and found a tree to nest in. That tree happened to be on Hitchcock's personal residence on the Universal backlot. The birds constantly shat on his car. The only solution was to remove the branches off the tree to force the crows to find a home elsewhere. But this is an Alfred Hitchcock film, so no matter what I say about the birds, they will never reach the level of douchebaggery that Hitchcock himself is capable of. The scene with the children running, Hitchcock wanted more children in the foreground. So they reshot against a projection screen with the original footage being shown as a backdrop. And so they put the children on treadmills so they could run in place. The treadmills were set too high. And well, children were falling and colliding and injuries were sustained. So abusing animals, check. Abusing children, check. What about women? Yes, he was obsessed with Tippi Hedren. He is famous for wanting control over his actresses. And according to Hedren's autobiography, he had her followed, had her handwriting analyzed, sang dirty limericks to her, gave her the most pointed criticisms, would change his attitude to one of ice cold after seeing her talk with another man. And yes, she claims he tried to force himself upon her one evening while in the limousine. Hedren even thought she was being punished towards the end. The final scene where she's trapped in a room with dozens of birds attacking her, those were real birds being launched at her for an entire week. The first time she sat in a makeup chair to have her cuts and blood applied to her face, she was so horrified at what she saw in the mirror, she excused herself to go vomit. Tippy endured real cuts and real injuries filming the final scene. She was exhausted, hurt, physically drained, mentally depleted. A doctor finally stepped in and ordered her to a hospital for a week's worth of rest that Hitchcock tried to deny, but the doctor held firm. So, in a couple of the final shots of the film, there's a stand-in for Hedren because she was recuperating and could not resume filming at the time. Now, I can hear the cancel chants coming. Was Hitchcock a despicable human being towards Hedren? Yes. Did he have issues with other actresses in other movies? Yes. Is he still a legendary filmmaker who still retains the greatest collection of horror and suspense in cinematic history? Yes. My only question is this. If it was really so bad for Hedren, why did she agree to film another movie right after with Hitchcock? Did she feel trapped in her contract? Was she forced into it by the studios? I don't know. So everybody make up your own mind. But I still look at his works and think masterpieces. Psycho, North by Northwest, Vertigo, Rope, Rear Window, To Catch a Thief, Dial M for Murder, Frenzy, Marnie, The Birds. All classics and not many in the industry can boast such quality of films. And whether you like them or hate them, he was a filmmaking genius. The Birds, yes, my favorite of all Hitchcock films. A film that delivers tension, builds suspense, inspired generations of filmmakers to come. A film that is also defined by its troubled production, its treatment of its actors, actresses, and animal partners. A film where physical injury was just expected after a while. The Birds is one of those films that requires the audience to separate the art from artist. It is one of those films that once you see it, you understand its footprint on the world of cinema, and it remains a classic film made by a legendary and flawed director who created both real and imagined nightmares for audiences, cast, and crew. And that's what I think. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. Have you seen The Birds? Are you a fan of Alfred Hitchcock? And what's your favorite Alfred Hitchcock film? Thank you for tuning into this week's edition of Retro Movie Review Theater. I'll see you next week with another offering. Until then, from south of the border, I'm still your reluctant gringo. Salud and a huevo.